Thank you all. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sharon Epperson. I am the senior personal finance correspondent at CNBC and a longtime journalist. And about 20 years ago, I met a wonderful, exciting, exuberant, had it all together journalist. I thought at the time, I thought at the time, Michelle Miller. We met at a National Association of Black Journalists convention through a mutual friend. And I thought, these two ladies, they've got it together. And indeed, your friend Suzanne Malveau and you have it together. Thank you. Absolutely. So you all know her from those of you who are from here, from being and from watching her all the time on TV locally. And you know her now as the host of CBS Saturday Morning. Um, but what some of you who watch her all the time and think you know her on TV don't know is that she is a wife and a mother and a sister and a cousin and a dear friend and has so many loved ones and she's also a daughter. And that connection is one that many may not have known or understood how much that meant to what she did in her life throughout her childhood, her career, and her family. So today we're going to talk a little bit, Michelle, about why you decided to write a book about your journey, about belonging, and about a daughter's <coughs> journey in particular. That's a question. That's a question. That's a question. Why? The question is why. Well, so it's funny. Um, I was talking to Mar Mark Morial, my husband. Um, <laughs> I was talking to him because he was insistent that I write a book from the moment he heard my story, my origin story. And I was literally talking to him yesterday and I asked him and I said, you know, why did you think like this was such, such a need for me? And he said, I, I'm so glad you did this. I'm so proud because you needed to get this off your chest. And I was like, I did? He said, oh yeah, you did. <laughs> and I said, what, what left you with that impression? And I said, he said, um, because when you hadn't even told me the story, you asked me when we started dating, don't abandon me. And he said, hmm, I don't know what that means, but it means something. And so, Part of the reason I believe, one, my husband, I've pretty much done most of the things he's asked me to do because he's always been sort of like that person who's pushed me out there. Um, he's been a great supporter of mine, but um, the other reason I wrote the book was, I'm gonna tell you, opportunity. And I hear so many people talk about how they wanna write a book and they don't get an opportunity to write a book. My opportunity came through CBS News in a story that I was asked or was assigned after the murder of George Floyd. Um, I, because I cover so many uh, community policing stories, social justice stories, and that sort of nexus between the right and wrong practices in police departments. Because we know there, there are police who do protect and serve, mm -hmm. and then we have to know that there are police who are not doing their job correctly and who are, who are not enforcing the law. And so um, I, I did the story. I literally, it was a stream of consciousness. It just flowed out of me onto my, I dictated the script. And 20, about 20 seconds in the middle of the piece, I said, um, racism has affected me all of my life from the very beginning because I, had, I came from a loving, my father's loving, fam you know, my, my father, I, ca I came into this world and was loved by my father and my grandmother and on my mother's side, no one to this day knows I exist. So I remain my mother's secret to my knowledge, um, I am not in contact with her. Um, but that, that moment on television, I, you know, it's funny how you expose certain things. <laughs> you just think it's, you know, kind of just a, just, just a little taste of, that might bring some things into context of why, you know, the lens is what it is. 
Um, but 37 minutes after the story aired, a HarperCollins publisher wrote me an email and said, one, uh, that floored me, two, that is book worthy, and three, may I please be your publisher. That's fantastic. And you have to seize those opportunities, but it took you being honest and being real in a moment when all of us were raw. And I think it was hard, as journalists, we're always told to be, at least at the start of our careers, objective. Mm -hmm. Now the situation has changed, and people want to hear your voice in the story somewhat, but also, at that time, what you were saying, I think resonated with a lot of people, including the person who reached out to you. Right, so I, I have to be honest. I don't think journalists are objective. I'm sorry, Joe Duke, my former boss. I, I think that's an aspiration. I think we are all colored by the lens from which we come. You can be fair, you can be truthful, you can be accurate, but objectivity, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna fake it to pretend like any of us come from that lens. Mm -hmm. There is just impossible, right? right? But you, we check ourselves at the door every time we walk in, right? And so in the book, it's interesting, I'm kind of jumping around here, yeah, but I think it's really important, important since I stated that, and I'll give you an example. I was an intern at the Star Tribune in Minneapolis. Um, in 1988, I had just come back from a semester abroad in Kenya and Tanzania. If you know Minneapolis, it's, it's a lovely city and the people were very welcoming and they were, they, were, they were really wonderful to the minority interns that came in. I mean, they housed us, they exposed us, they, they really, it was just such a great summer. But at the, and, and that included at the paper. But there was an instance where one of the higher ups, I don't want to like say, because I probably did in the book, I can't remember. But, <laughs> but yeah, names. I'm not going to say it right now, but you'll read it when you get it. names. But there was a, there was, there was a very high ranking <laughs> editor executive, I will say executive, who uh, was giving us the welcome and telling us, you know, giving us pearls of wisdom. And this man said to this group of minority journalists, along with the entire news staff, you know, these are men and women in the press corps, in order to be a good journalist, you need to check your blackness at the door. Mm -hmm. 1988. And, and you need, and he didn't go on to say check your womanhood too, but I, I just like, I, I, I just sat there and I was kind of like, you know, a couple of my coworkers here, I've always like, I'm not a filtered person. I have, you know, never was a person who could filter well. Uh, so <laughs> I've been blessed with having friends who accept me anyway. <laughs> but I was just so floored and hurt and, and coming off of this, you know, spring awakening in Africa, I just was like emboldened to raise my hand and say to him, sir, um, I, I'm sorry, I can't do that. And let me tell you why. I was not born an eight ounce, nine pound journalist. I was, I was born a black female or whatever other makeup is inside this DNA. That, that, you know, a lot, there are a lot of things in here. But I was like, so, so I can't believe, one, you said that, but let me ask you this. Has anyone ever asked you to set aside your white maleness? I mean, <laughs> seriously. I mean, let's look at it from, let's flip the script and see. So the normalization of whiteness, I kind of came into, because I just come from a very different lens, right? So it was like stark for me to see. Like the normalization of whiteness was very apparent to me. And I was saying, you know, that's normal for white people, right. but there are all these other people that aren't white. And we're, we're forced to fit into the normalization of someone else's being. Right. And that's not fair to us. Right. But what you talk about also in the book is that it is not just black or white. Right. Particularly for us. For us. 
That's the other thing. And, and, and so having to, <laughs> to, to, to at times choose how you wanted to identify because other people had chosen for you how oh, they yes. want to identify you. You know, so people look at me and they're like, what are you? Right? So it's funny, it was, I remember going to a conference and a, a news director said to me, um, what are you? And I said, I'm black. And he said, yeah, but what else? And I said, um, well, my mother, I understand, is Hispanic. He said, okay, you need to change your name to fit the quote unquote affirmative action. Mm -hmm. So you hit two categories. And I was like, I'm not no. doing that. That's no. not my name. I don't need mm -hmm. to, to take on an identity that isn't already on the birth certificate. But, but aside from that, how many of you guys have done like Ancestry.com or just that many? Oh, yeah. I'm surprised. So, you know, I did it. And you know, you guys are well versed in, in like miscegenation through the, through the years, yeah. especially in a place like New Orleans. So a lot of black people are, you know, have a lot of, you know, white ancestry. And so I, I just have to say, technically, I'm 51% European, but I was raised by a black family. So my 33% African, West African um, um, lineage and my African American culture is what I claim because mm -hmm. in, in the greater American society, that's what I claim. It's a very nuanced, very, you know, it, it is what it is because of the societal, because of the so society we live in. And then I have Native American um, blood, you know, from the Sonoran region, which is <laughs> right on the border. I mean, I'm like right on the border, Texas border, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. And so that stems from my mother's side. And she had European blood. My father had European blood. So, you know, I'm a hodgepodge. When um, did you decide, when did you decide, and why did you decide that you wanted to find out all of who you were? You were, you were brought up by your father right. and your grandmother, so, raised in a black family, but knowing from an early age something Well, it mom. wasn't, so it was, for me, um, it was just the awkwardness of explaining to people like where my mother was. And so you, 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 know, you get to a certain age, people don't see your mother coming. My grandmother was at everything. My father was at everything. Um, and so you guys are, are you clued in to like my origin story? Maybe we ought to do that first. So basically my, my father would always explain it to me um, in the third person. Your mother and father met, they fell in love, and then your mother could no longer be with your father, and she had to leave. And so I took, as a little kid, I said, okay. Um, and then when I grew up in South Central Los Angeles, and pretty much all of my neighbors and everyone I saw was from like this nuclear family. Great, it was such a great, neighborhood because like to my left I had these elderly white neighbors the cannons they were so awesome in front I had these um, you know Mr. and Mrs. Holmes they were from New Orleans right they went to Dillard University and then I later taught at Dillard so I was like oh you know it was just like <laughs> heaven sent the Tolsons were down the street and they all had kids and it was, and so I noticed, hey, there's something different. But when I went to elementary school and the, the higher grades in elementary school, kids started asking me, where's your mom? And it just became easier for me to say, I don't have one, right? I don't, I don't have a mom. And my dad overheard me one day and he pulled me aside and he said, you do have a mother. She just doesn't live with you. Don't say that. But he never, really talked about her. And I, and I wish I could ask him now why, why he felt so closed off about talking about her mm -hmm. and their situation because I would later discover a number of different things and you have to read it exactly. in the book. Exactly. We don't want to give it all away. <clears throat> We're not gonna give it all away. <laughs> when, I read, when I read this book and when you all read this book, I think it resonates with people because it's, it's from a time when everything had to be perfect 
or I think oh my a lot gosh. of us thought it had to be perfect. Yes. How many of you black, guys? White, whatever. You, it, your home you, had to be yes. perfect. Your family had to be perfect. And, and that's so not true, right? And, and we know now, and that's why I'm so glad we're doing this here on Tulane's campus, where young people today, they're like, it's not perfect. Let me show you all of what it is. Or it's not normal. And, and it's, Back to the right, normal. Normal right, is a whole right. lot of things, right? Exactly. To a whole lot of different people. And so it, you know, it is, th thank you for, 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 for speaking it, of it in that yeah. way, because yeah. it truly is, um, I hope, because so many people, when I tell them the story, they find out about the story, they walk up and they say, me too. So many people. Me too, right? Um, and not a day goes by that, you know, I don't find someone who is adopted, whose father left, whose mother left, for the same reason. Two days ago, I was having a book event. Uh, my dear friend Therese Duke was there. And she, a woman came up and she showed me a picture of a woman with me in the picture uh, and said, do you remember her? And I said, of course I remember her. She was one of the many women who was a pseudo mother to me. And she taught me, she was the first person to blow dry my hair. I'll never, and I loved, you know, like, cause she got it so silky and cause I had like it's massive. It's amazing how you remember the first people that did your hair. Oh, I yeah. remember my first. Oh, I do. Cause she did it. House. She did it. You know, and it was, yeah. it was, it was like the, a, you know, a different, cause my hair was like so curly, frizzy. I didn't know how to do it. Nobody, my grandmother, she would take Afro Sheen and she would like <laughs> plaster it in my hair. And, and for those of you who know, don't know what Afro Sheen is, it was like this blue, very, very, um, it, it was for really dry um, black folks hair. And my it, grandmother- It was something everyone wanted to and see. And everybody had college, it. college, they wanted to see what, what is it? Right. How do you- And it, because we, our hair is dry. Yes. Right? And so we need to nourish it with lots of oil. And yeah. that's when, it, but my hair, when I was little, I had, I had like, you know, my hair changed many textures. I've had many textures of hair. And, but I had, I had Karen Swenson hair, like straight <laughs> white girl hair when I was really little. And then it just got, it got curlier and curlier and curlier the older I got, so yeah. funny to talk about hair. Does that happen <laughs> to white people? You start off with one grade of hair, and then by your teenage years, you have a whole different grade of hair? Okay, that's good to know. We see, we're not so different. But I forgot the question. No, it's, <laughs> it's all right, it's all right. But you were talking about how so many people have come up to you and said that they're going through the same thing. So I wanted to ask you, in, in the acknowledgments, there's a mutual friend of ours you, know, you acknowledge there, Caroline Clark, who told, who has a memoir where she tells an origin story that was also a difficult story to tell. So she told the story, and I did a story on her, and it's <clears throat> interesting. I'm going to go into, I'm going to point out some people here too, but she, um, she did, she is the adopted daughter <clears throat> of a great family. She would later discover she was the granddaughter, birth granddaughter to Nat King Cole. She was. Um, the child of Nat's adopted daughter, who was actually his wife's niece. So I think the sister yeah. of his wife died. She, she adopted the child. She was like Nat, Natalie Cold's big sister, <clears throat> in essence. And um, she later discovered she had an affair, like kind of a whirlwind weekend with this guy she met in New York. And she got pregnant, her mother finds out, she sends her away to have the baby, and essentially she forces her to give her up. The baby was born on Christmas Day, mm -hmm. six weeks, because you know they were protecting Nat, because everything had to be perfect. perfect. So they were protecting Nat's reputation. I don't know how that was bad on him, but six weeks later, he died. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? Yeah. You give away your child because you're protecting your father's reputation. Mm -hmm. And he oh. dies six weeks later. <clears throat> so she says to me, okay, well, first no, of all, so, well, no, no, no. So, so let me, say, let me okay. tell the whole story. So, so, the, so I, you remember what I told you about the publisher thing? So HarperCollins um, is, 
I have an affiliation with, through my, my job with Simon & Schuster. And there was um, a lovely Simon & Schuster publisher who I was talking to, and, um, and then she had to go away because she got a big, fat, amazing job. Can I say what it is? Can I tell that story? You can tell that story. No, no, no. I'm, if I hear, if I, okay, okay. So anyway, <laughs> but I will say that that person essentially told Caroline, um, will you help Michelle? And so she, she gave me the template for the proposal. And then and when she, to, to help me write my proposal, because mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was doing, right? Um, but she said to me, um, she said, are you sure you want to do this? And it was funny because I didn't ask her, what do you mean, are you sure? And she said, no, because you have to be sure. And I was like, I think so. What do you think she meant by that? She, did, she, I, you, to reveal uh, everything, you reveal <clears throat> yeah. a lot in this book. And yeah. were you sure that you no. wanted no, no, and no. It was kind of like that stream of consciousness with that three and a half minute piece um, that I dictated because that's really how this book came to be. I had a co-writer who was amazing. Her name's Rosemary Rabotham. Give her a big hand. She is amazing. And, um, and she, you know, she, like, I didn't know what stories of mine would resonate. I didn't know what stories of mine were, like, golden, would, would, would have an incredible arc, and she did. And the thing about long-form writing and writing, like, a memoir or a novel is, like, you really have to, you have to kind of follow, you have to keep people interested. Right. And she was able to mine for me what, what was necessary. And I think, I think about um, what I do for a living. I, I like mine from other people. Very easy for me right. to get somebody to lay out their life story. I now know how they feel when I'm in that process, but, <laughs> but um, it's to turn the tables on myself was a completely different yeah. experience. Yeah. I thought it would be interesting for this audience, because many people have been watching you for years, starting right here, to talk about New Orleans. You do, of course, talk about that quite a bit in the book, but there's a reason when you came to New Orleans, I think it was a pivotal time. Yes, yeah, so, um, so basically, okay, so basically, I lived in Columbia, South Carolina for a year and a half before I came here, and everyone always says, what brought you to New Orleans? And I'm about to read you what brought me to New Orleans, but I was, I had a year and a half contract in Columbia, it was coming up, but I was also under the threat of a lawsuit because a story that I had done um, uh, on a weekend, uh, which no one should have ever attempted to do, was a story about a little girl who had allegedly been molested by a neighbor and the police allegedly did not act on the behalf of the mom who claimed the child had been molested. And I don't know why my, my assignment editor insisted on us doing the story. They should have been fired too, but they weren't. Um, but we went, we did the story, and, and there was a clip that the editor utilized of the, the girl in which he didn't cut her from turning around. And in essence, because it was a headline, I, I'm not over the headline, but uh, it was my story. So there were three of us who ended up getting fired. It was me, it was, um, it was the editor photographer, and it was the, uh, the producer of the show. Yeah. Um, before that happened, I was called to New Orleans, you know, by a news director who, whose name was Joe Duke. Joe Duke, will you please stand up, please? <laughs> Give him a big round of applause. So, Joe Duke, I say, was a compact man. <laughs> Barely five foot five with merry blue eyes and a ruddy face and a blonde handlebar mustache. <laughs> Pretty spot on, right? What he lacked in stature, he more than made up for his crackling energy and an imbu ebullient, I can't even say the word, thank you, ebullient wit. 
He greeted, he greeted me with a megawatt smile, the kind of father gives you, and you've, you've been gone way too long, and he's welcoming you home. It steadied me at once and encouraged me to think, okay, Michelle, you've got this. I would soon learn that Joe, a shrewd journalist, had a way of making people feel safe enough to let down their guard, only to have him zero in on salient details like the veteran news hound he was. This approach had propelled the Louisiana native up through the ranks and into a leadership role at WWL-TV. His expansive warmth and astute sense of people would work its magic on me too. My round of interviews went well on the first day. On day two, Joe Duke pronounced himself pleased with the feedback he'd received about me and suggested that to celebrate my success, we should grab lunch before I headed to the airport for my flight back to South Carolina. He chose Mr. B's in the French Quarter, a fine dining establishment famous for its mouthwatering Creole cuisine. Order anything you want, Joe declared, snapping open his white linen napkin and smoothing it across his lap. I so remember that. <laughs> I understood he was trying to impress me with the taste of the best his city had to offer, and he looked crestfallen when I ordered potato and leek soup and a humble green salad. <laughs> This is on the station, he assured me. <laughs> you can go bigger than that. I hated to break it to him. I'm a vegan, I said with an apologetic smile. Then noticing the sommelier standing at his shoulder holding out a, lo a list of fine wines, I added, and I don't drink either. <laughs> That's since changed. <laughs> you do know you're trying out for a job in this city that care for God, he said, his laughter booming. I laughed too and expressed the hope that despite being a teetotaler, I might still have a shot. Well, I already think you'll be a really good fit for the job, he began, but stopped. He must have caught the grimace that flitted across my face before I could snatch it back. What's wrong, he asked. All morning I'd been fighting the desire to come clean about the situation at my station in South Carolina. Now since Joe Duke missed nothing, he had given me the perfect opening. And I won't read any more. But essentially, the question I felt the need and felt so compelled was, do I tell him in some way, shape, or form what I was going through? Right? Because I felt so flawed. I felt so damaged. I felt like I messed up so badly. And I don't know. I don't know why I felt this need to tell you, Joe. I don't know. But it's um, about integrity. Well, and what you're about as a journalist is about integrity. Right. And so I, I felt like I, okay, so obviously I told him something. And the, and, and the funny thing is how it all sort of like came kind of tumbling down. And in the, he, he didn't really know the full story. He later got the full story, and the question was, do I hire her? And he since shared with me a really, because this isn't in the book, so I'll share it with <laughs> you. He told me after, you know, his, you know, he, he, he thought about it long and hard, and he said, um, he said, I called the news director in South Carolina, right? And what did you say, Joe? What did he say? And so, like, I'm that meant, like, so, so and this, he told me again. this just, like, within the last year. Right before the pandemic, because I think, like, serendipity and crazy stuff like that happens to me all the time. 2019... I'm at NABJ, I'm walking down the hall, um, and this man runs up to me, and he says, Michelle, I don't know if you remember me. And I looked at him, and I was like, Randy Covington, I will never forget you. And he said, I hope that's not a bad thing. I said, no, I said, look, you had to do what you had to do. And I've never, anyone who's fired me or, you know, or put me in a bad situation. Like, I never look at those things. I never demonize the person. Well, there's one person I demonize. <laughs> but that man, like, deserves it. <laughs> Read the book. Um, but 
but, but I, so I've never demonized anybody who's put a challenge before me, a roadblock, a stumbling. They just gave me like the impetus to jump over it or to find a way around it. Like I look at things like that because in the end, you know, it makes you better. The time wasn't right. I look at life kind of like that, right? right? It's hard to swallow in the moment. But, um, like, I look, you know, and, like, it's taken time. But that's how I view things. And he happened to be one of those people. I didn't feel, I, it was, he was a tough guy. But I never thought, like, he, like he was a racist or anything like that. Right. I never thought he was unfair. I thought he was a little too hard on all of us who worked for him. He was like an equal opportunity, like hard driver. But I never had any ill will toward him. And he said, I hope I can say it without, without coming off. And I say, you say whatever you want to me. Exactly. I'm listening. And he said, Michelle, I'm so proud of you. Oh, and awesome. I was like, oh my gosh. I would have, it was like, you know how you just, you want to, you want to make the people who have taken a chance on you or who had to, in their estimation, let you go. Yes. Right? Yes. And you want, in the end, for them to feel like either, not that they made a mistake, but, but that they, that you, you learned from, you learned from that process. Absolutely. And then you also want the people who took a chance on you to know that they did something, they were right. And, they, and you want them, like not a day goes by that I don't thank Joe for taking a chance on me because New Orleans changed my life. Absolutely, and that's why all these people are so excited that you came back, yeah. right? So excited, so excited. Can I just say one yes. other thing? Because yes. I, I said this like to some people last night. I was like saying, you know what's crazy is that you talked about the normalization. Are we almost, oh, we got 11 minutes. Yes. So we talked. I want people to ask questions. Yes, yes, Please we're going to get there. come to the mic but, if you have a question, it's but, your time. But it was funny, it was funny because um, <laughs> at the time I started dating Mark, I was thinking, ooh, I don't fit his cookie cutter family, right? And I remember a couple of years before, I had had this dream, right? I had this dream that like, you know, John John, you know who John John is, JFK Jr. Right, because I had met him early on and um, that's not in the book either, but <laughs> it was a brief meeting. No, there's no salaciousness to it. But, um, and then I had this dream that he asked me to marry him. And I was like, I woke up thinking, like, whoa, this was something. And he said, Michelle, in the dream, Michelle, I don't care what your origin story is. I love you. And I was like, John, John, you're so, you're so incredibly, like, that's so modern of you. And, and it was kind of that way with Mark. Um, if you had told me that, like, a first lady of a city like this, which, let's face it, you guys know, you guys are, like, equal parts up like completely different kinds of people. You're the city that care for God, and then you're like this very provincial town, right? You know that, right? You know that. You know that about New Orleans. <laughs> but like, if someone had told me I would like marry into the family I did, and and I would become a first lady, and I would be all that kind of like stuff, right. I'm like, no way, right? But then what I did was sort of like I kind of broke a mold. Right. right? I was kind of different did. in every way. Absolutely. <clears throat> I, I do want to have people, if you have a question, please come to the mic to ask your question. Um, but one of the things that I think also will resonate with many people is what is family? Mm -hmm. and, the, and I'd like you to talk about what it is, but, but I think that there is, the people need to understand that you can have a blood, blood relatives that make up your family, but you can build your family. Mm -hmm. You can create a family that you want with loved ones, with blood relatives, with colleagues, with friends that you've made over the years. And I think it's a beautiful story about how you've done that. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, I, I think uh, I have always sort of been a loner, so to speak, mm -hmm. who had lots of different kinds of people in my life. Like I... Like, it's kind of, when I, it started in junior high school, really, because I always only had one friend until junior high school. And I talk about my one friend, right? My one friend, Michelle Woods, who, like, 
taught me that you see yourself as you see yourself. And, and I'm still like challenged by that, but she like, she, if she had opportunity, she could have been anybody. Mm -hmm. But she, you know, she was limited. She ended up growing up. Um, she, she had a child you know, at 18. She, um, she's working hard now. She's, but she, you know, she had like college as an opportunity. She, she was so confident, so self-secure. And she taught, so I had somebody, she was like one of my role models. And I have a lot of role models like that, mm -hmm. you know, peer role models. But then in junior high, I decided I was going to change my brand. Who does that? <laughs> in junior high. In junior high. I said, I want friends and I want them to be really, uh, I want them to like be me. Like, so that meant they had to be diverse in every way. So I had black friends, like, so I had a black friend and uh, a, um, a Filipina friend, a Hispanic friend, a Jewish friend, a mixed friend, and then I was in a class full of, actually I had two black friends, and I was in a class full of mostly Jewish kids because we were in the special mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. But, and I didn't like pick them like that. It's just, that's we, it just kind of, it just kind of mm -hmm. happened. So I said, oh, that's so crazy. Like we, they, like it all happened like that. And then, and then I decided I want to, I want to lose weight because I was a chubby kid, really chubby. And so I was like, I want to lose weight. So I went to a weight loss camp and I came back and everything started to happen, right? And, and there's a pivotal moment in the book where I had come into like this brand. It was like, yes. oh, Michelle Miller, I have my <laughs> friends and I like have my new like, like new presence about me, and I was feeling so good. I was you knew a straight how to be an influencer before they right, and I work. was a straight A student. I was like, I had that. I beat every, so every boy who always used to tease me. I made sure I got better grades than they did. <laughs> so, and then finally, there was a boy in class who liked me. And it's so funny that my uh, my girlfriend, um, my my. Um, Lost my train of thought, but my, what was I trying to say? So you were saying that they started to like you in high school. You had yeah, 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 no, but was there was, there was, yeah, but anyway, uh, the, um, so the boy, no, my boyfriend, my boyfriend, Otis Livingston, I'm pointing him out because I ended up working with him. He's from LA. We worked together in New York, same profession, same building, same network. It's crazy. So Otis and I are still friends to this day. He comes up with a friend, Paul and says, let's ask Michelle. She's black, she'll know the answer. And the boy that kind of was, you know, jiving with me, I could feel the, 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 the tensity in his body. And I said, this, is, this was like that line, okay, of identity, mm -hmm. right? And I, and I knew, I said, you know what, one thing, this is, the, this is that line, you better, you better be real with it. Right. What does it mean when you identify, and what, and what does it do to the people you love? That was my first inclination. Three, he's going to treat me differently. So you see me. You see the kind of person I am. I was, and I was even more hyper and more like, ah. What? And yeah, same person. And so I turned to him, and he was ashen white. And he's, mm. I said, he said, you're black? And I said, yes, what did you think I was? He said, I thought you were Jewish. I said, really? I'll take that. And I actually thought, I actually thought, okay, we're good. He just, you know. But he literally was the angriest kid toward me, would not speak to me, never treated me the way he treated me before. And I just was floored. I was like, oh. This is racism at work. Illogical, doesn't have, make any sense in the world. Same person here, you don't like them because there's a label. Right. I don't get it. it. Doesn't make any sense. And I just still have never gotten it. And it infuriates me. And I hate that we put labels on people and I hate we, that we aren't human to one another. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, do, I have such an intolerance for intolerance. And I hope that everyone here understands how much community 
means yes. to me yes. and the communities I live in, when I talk about that loner, I'm a loner in many different spaces. And what would be so wonderful if, is if all those spaces had those, those circles, and they do have those circles that align. Yeah. Um, so that, that's what I really wanted to ask you. I think, peop I think people will come away with, from their own perspectives and their own journeys, different thoughts about what belonging really means to them after reading this book. But what do you want people to understand about belonging? What is belonging to you? That, that we are all normal, <laughs> really, you know, in our lives. And no matter what our origin stories are, that we are in control of what we make our lives. We create the love and we manufacture the success. And we obviously get help from a lot of people, right? but you only have your reputation, your hard work ethic, and your ability to see things, not just from your own point of view, but from the point of view of many people. And that is what I hope, you know, people glean from this, is that, you know, you are me, I am you, and I see you, I see you, I see you, and all your glory. And I hope you see me in that way too. I absolutely felt that way when I read the book. I hope you all enjoy that too. We, have, we do have one question. Yay! Yeah. 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 I'm gonna try. Yes. Um, so I have two kids. They're mixed race. What okay. advice would you give me and them in 2023? Okay. Hey. <laughs> Love them. Help them understand um, cause, because we still live in a society that sees them a certain way. Make sure they know their history, most important, and the contributions. Uh, learn, learn for yourself how beautiful our contribution as African Americans is to this nation, how deep it is. From the very first patriot to die in this nation, to the man who laid out the capital of this nation, to the woman who, or the man who sent the Webb telescope into space. Our history is vast. We've had an incredible impact on everyone in this nation. And this idea that we don't matter, and that's really what it comes down to. And it's not just African Americans. Every marginalized community, and even I tell women are Absolutely. marginalized. And there was a great book talk that I moderated yesterday by Eric Holder. The book is Our Unfinished March. And in it, he talks about everyone winning the right to vote, even white men. Because in our nation, white men could not vote unless they owned property. Yeah. And the fight was real. And so let's be more inclusive. We have this nature of trying to be exclusive and leave people out of the process, make things harder for people. Let's not do that. Let's, let's like see what we can be. Together. together. Belonging together. Belonging together. Belonging together. Belonging together. Thank you so much. Your question will be answered directly by Michelle later because we have to wrap it up. We have but seven everyone, seconds. But everyone is going to go from this venue to sign books with Okay, you. let's go. Yeah. Thank you'll tell us what to do. Thank you all for coming. Michelle will be Thank signing books in Peterson Lobby.